Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Clara Matei. She is an assistant professor in the economics department of the New School of, for Social Research. And today we're going to talk about her book, Capital, The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. So, Dr. Matei, welcome Hello. to the show. And there's the book. Thank you, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for uh, accepting the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so tell us first, because I think this is important to set up the rest of the conversation. So what really happened when it comes to the relationships between the state and ownership during World War I that probably it changed the perspective people had on that? Okay, um, thank you. Yes, certainly. So the, my book, The Capital Order, um, aims at reconstructing the origins of austerity by situating uh, austerity um, in a moment in which um, the status quo of free market ca capitalism came, came under attack. Why did it come under attack? Well, it came under attack, and this is the reconstruction, the historical reconstruction of the book, uh, because the First World War, World War I, was a massive shock to uh, the capitalist economy and as it was understood until that historical moment. Mm -hmm. So looking at the years 1914, 1918, we see that it was a moment in which the state massively intervened uh, in the economy. So it basically breached the normal boundaries of its actions and um, collectivized a lot of the production. Uh, so it actually nationalized or directly controlled private enterprises and especially began to become the major employer in uh, all countries that were participating in the First World War. So um, this massive shock to laissez-faire capitalism, the, what was understood until that moment, the only form of capitalism possible, was very important because it created a situation by which citizens, bureaucrats, um, party leaders, but also common workers began uh, thinking that fundamentally what they had understood as the only society possible in, until that moment could actually evolve into a different society. And so this is why um, the First World War started, triggered a very serious crisis, existential crisis of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And what happened after the war? I mean, because basically the relationship between the state uh, and the market uh, changed during that period. Uh, I mean, did that empower in any way workers after the war? Yeah, so the thesis, uh, the historical thesis that I um, I uncover uh, through a lot of primary uh, sources, so I go and look at directly at what was happening at the time through newspapers, uh, files of the of state bureaucrats, um, pamphlets of workers, really tries to bring back to life a moment in history in which, because of this repoliticization of what was until that moment considered normal and natural, private property of the means of production and the wage relations, because again, the state had intervened and fundamentally publicized private property and uh, started directly disciplining workers rather than leaving that to the free market transactions. Mm -hmm. Well, this created a situation by which there was a lot of um, discontent for um, the high exploitation levels that were structural before but became even bigger during the war and thus fundamentally um, the need in 1919 to think about a different society which yes began uh, through 
uh, a lot of workers' movements. So uh, the capital order, the first part of the capital order is all about the different types of um, workers' mobil mobilizations that emerged after the First World War. And uh, many were really about thinking about a different society that was no longer about private property of the means of production and wage relations, but it was more about situating the worker as central to the economy. And to go back to your question, absolutely, the fact is that after the First World War, um, the workers had indeed gained unprecedented rights that had been granted actually by the state itself, especially in Britain, but also in Italy, it's interesting to see that high degrees of exploitation were maintained in order, of mm -hmm. course, to increase the production for uh, war purposes. But at the same time, you needed to reinforce a uh, worker's commitment to the capitalist state. And so the state had indeed granted not only some form of welfare uh, rights, unemployment benefits, uh, health care, but um, also higher wages and um, promises for a better future. And that was a, a very big deal. So the workers were at once empowered by state intervention during the war, even if highly exploited, uh, but also at the same time were not satisfied with this empowerment and were asking really to go beyond mere social reform towards forms of economic organization that were really post-capitalist by putting their own agency as producers at the center rather than just being wage employ employers for a wage, they wanted to directly be in charge of production and distribution. Mm -hmm. By the way, and just to illustrate all of this, I would like to ask you specifically about wage relations, because during World War I, uh, as you talk about in the book, there was lots of state control over wage relations. And um, I mean, capitalists usually claim that uh, the wages are mostly determined by the market. You just let the market run its course and it determines the wages. But how are wages really determined? Um, well, during the war, it became clear that um, in a situation in which the very short labor supply, right, there were very few workers around because many had gone to the front to fight the war in the trenches, and there was a lot of labor demand because um, there was need for the workforce in a moment in which industrial production and I had increased massively in order to um, meet the war uh, necessities. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in this moment that, uh, of course, if the only supply and demand of the market were functioning, then the workers would have had enormous bargaining power and they could have really um, set wages so high that there would have been no surplus and fundamentally no possibility uh, for profits to even be possible in that historical moment. So clearly it became obvious that the state intervened politically in order to cut the bargaining and gaining power of the workers, how while well, the state um, controlled the mobility of labor. So mm -hmm. in Italy, the, my book is all about the capital order is a comparison between the Italian reality and the British reality. Um, in Britain, uh, the state passed these leaving certificates that meant that workers, in order to leave their jobs, they had to really ask permission to their employer. And so th in this way, they were curbing the mobility of labor. But in Italy, it was even harsher in the sense that the state was actually directly militarized the workers and was controlling where these workers would work and was disciplining them so that if they decided not to go to work, not only strikes were made illegal, but you were also fined if you gave up going to work. So these were just measures that really, I think, um, uncovered uh, and revealed how uh, this idea of the impersonal laws of the market as something external to um, 
state institution and collective decision making was all ideology and that actually, of course, wage relations are set by a variety of factors and especially they can be definitely curbed by political intervention. So the idea here is that workers realized that political intervention had um, increased their exploitation during the war, but mm -hmm. there was also the idea that this political intervention could be used to emancipate workers, either directly from the part of the state that could actually deliver in through reforms um, that were favorable to the workers, but also directly through uh, many, many, the worker council movement, that is one of the uh, projects that I um, uncover that was very popular in 1919 in Britain and in Italy, and not just, you know, in Soviet Russia and other places in Eastern Europe. Um, worker council movement were all about abolishing this capitalist state with wage relations and substituting wage relations with something very different in which the workers would be empowered um, of their own labor and would set, you know, uh, would actually collaborate in the production process and collaborate in distribution rather than just being paid a wage, would actually just participate in production democratically. Mm -hmm. So after the war, how did workers organize themselves collectively and what were their main demands and goals? So it's uh, it's very difficult to give um, one way answer because there were in fact a plurality of different movements with different demands yeah. going from more reformist to more revolutionary. And so in the spectrum, I try to look at, I, I talk about, different cases in chapter three and four of the book. Um, so I can just mention a few. Mm -hmm. um, we can think about in Britain, there was the Guild Socialist Movement uh, that was all about creating these guilds in which workers were participating collectively in deciding what to produce and how to um, deliver their labor. And the idea was that there would be no production for profit, but, but only for use. So the building guilds were very important in Britain in which um, the they would uh, build houses, but uh, would remunerate the workers. But if there was anything extra from what was actually uh, being produced, this wouldn't just be pocketed as profits, but would actually be given back to uh, the client, which in that case was, in fact, um, the local state of... Um, so an idea of uh, use rather than profit and emancipated labor rather than uh, subordinated labor. So the building guilds were quite successful until austerity kicked in. And that's the, the real story I'm telling in the book is how all these um, alternatives to capitalism slowly died out because of the austerity attack but i guess we'll get into this in a minute another yes. example that we can give is the case of the workers council movement which was especially big in italy uh, and this was i focus on the story of l'ordine nuovo which was the movement led by antonio gramsci someone who we still remember very much today and yes. antonio gramsci was one of the leaders of l'ordine nuovo which was a, it was both a newspaper and a concrete movement. So in this case, what's interesting about the Workers' Council movement is that I think it has a lot of very interesting lessons for us in the present moment, because it was not only about rethinking how we produce, but also rethinking how we think about our economic world. Uh, so it was a, a direct attempt to give an alternative theory, a theory that would be about emancipating people and giving agency back to the people rather than a theory that uh, took agency away from the people. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, a very important theoretical insight was the idea that economic and political went hand in hand. So you could only have real political democracy if economic democracy was achieved. And how would you achieve economic democracy? Well, but through these councils, 
that were assemblies in which um, workers would elect the representative, but this representative was not just a union mem uh, union leader who then would go and do his own business, but was directly responsible and constantly in touch with the base. So an understanding of a council that was very um, alive in its mobility and its capacity to constantly uh, release decision making that was collective. Mm -hmm. uh, were the workers able to reach their goals at all? Well, um, I would say that for a brief moment, um, the goals were achieved and especially there were much more ambitious projects mm -hmm. that then were forestalled. But for certain, um, for example, the building guilds was was a reality and it happened for a couple of years. They were flourishing. It became in the thousands in, in Britain. And mm -hmm. so it was a very big movement that even economists, mainstream economists had to write about on their economic journals, being very surprised about the economic success of these experiments. The fact that workers were not just being lazy and staying at home, given that they had the possibility, but actually they were working more uh, because they really believed in the collective project. And in Italy, you know, we the uh, council movement was a reality in the sense that the councils achieved representative power in the mm -hmm. factory. And then uh, there was a moment in which um, there was a, a clash with the employers and this escalated into a month-long occupation of the factories throughout Italy in which workers did uh, manage to uh, continue producing on their own and this was really what triggered in Italy the real scare of a possible revolution and the reason why um, the counter-revolution was put into motion and especially the support for Benito Mussolini who in mm -hmm. those years uh, was already leading the fascist squads who were opposing these um, attempts to overcome capitalism through workers' councils. Mm -hmm. So when and how exactly does austerity get into the picture here? Right. So um, the capital order um, has this long first part in which I give voice to all of these alternatives to capitalism at large. Uh, mm -hmm. And I try to show how they were very concrete, um, both in terms of theory and policy in changing how we normally understand our society as mm -hmm. being run uh, through the market. Uh, in a capitalist fashion. So austerity comes into the picture because in these red years, 1919, 1920, in which workers had increased their bargaining power, wages were going up, all these different forms of, of uh, production relations were happening. Well, in this moment, of course, the ruling elite was very scared and um, the ruling elite at an international level organized in order to block and foreclose all of these alternatives to capitalism. Mm -hmm. So that's the second part of the capital order is all about reconstructing austerity as a technocratic global project of reaction to demands for social change. Mm -hmm. And what is austerity exactly about? Because if I understand it correctly, people who are in favor of austerity present it one way, but then the way it works and the results it really has and what it is a response to are different things, right? Um, certainly, yes. So... Um... <laughs> So I, I, it's difficult to say this in a few words, given that it took me hundreds of pages in the book to, <laughs> to discuss that. Right. Um, so, um, yes. So um, the attempt of the capital order is to give a different theory of austerity by mm -hmm. looking at its origins. So the claim here is that you can really understand the logic of austerity that is still very powerful today mm -hmm. and still shapes our society profoundly 
Yeah. Austerity is everywhere. It has been everywhere for 50 years, at least, I would claim, if not 100, which is really kind of uh, the origin moment. Uh, right. But it's especially here in this last six months. Um, I know very little about the Portuguese society, but certainly in the United States, in Britain, in Italy, mm -hmm. we are seeing increases in interest rates. So a big component of monetary austerity is the fact that interest rates are going up. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing cuts in social spending combined with regressive taxation. And regressive taxation means, simply put, that the poor pay, in relative terms, much more taxes than the rich. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that taxes are not uh, distributed according to your capacity your income but actually mm -hmm. if you're poor you spend more because consumption taxes are very high and consumption right. taxes hit everyone the same there is very little taxes on corporate taxes on profit taxes inheritance taxes every tax that would be redistributive because they would hit the rich and redistribute it through, through the rest are basically almost disappearing in, in the west today and this is a, a very real reality. So the point here is to say that austerity is um, a very political project. Um, and this, this is really the main thesis of the capital order is that austerity is not just a set of neutral um, tools to manage the economy, but it is a profoundly political um, project that has specific experts and state bureaucrats who, who adhere to this project and justify this project. And fundamentally, uh, while we hear today still that it is all about, we all sacrifice the same for the good of the whole, what I show is that, the sorry, what I show, the capital, what the capital order shows, because now it's, it's, it's a story on its own, it's not me anymore, uh, it's in, in, in the world as a book, what the capital order shows is that actually austerity has a very clear success in punishing the many in favor of the few. So the, the objective and the actual result of austerity is wage suppression, the increase of market dependence, the fact that the, we become more precarious um, in our position and we more and more depend on selling our labor power in return for a very low wage in order to make a living and this is why a big component of austerity is also privatization which takes away any rights of people right if before you had you were entitled to health care because of being a Portuguese citizen once privatization kicks in you will need to purchase your health care. And this mm -hmm. means that you will need to accept going to work even for low pay and bad hours because you have no alternative. So this thesis here is that austerity is not a necessity. It's a political construction and it's not neutral because it's specifically hitting the weaker strata of the population, which happens to be the majority. And mm -hmm. it makes our life more vulnerable and thus uh, silences any um, serious voice in favor of social change. So all of the possible mobilization towards a different society is fundamentally expelled because people are increasingly subdued by the market forces that operate against the people. And these market forces are not just a fact in the world, but they are triggered by the intervention of the state who, for example, in 1921 in Great Britain, explicitly uh, what happened was that the British Treasury, so the state institution with the central bank, the Bank of England, mm -hmm. explicitly induced the downturn by increasing interest rates and cutting social expenditures. And this economic slump, this downturn, increased the unemployment level and thus really killed 
the uh, power of the workers who were then disciplined into accepting capitalism once again. So this is the idea that austerity induces also depressions, and this is not a mistake, um, as some have us think, but it's actually explicitly um, done because of the need to keep unemployment high, keep our precarity high, so that we accept an unjust economic system and uh, think that this is the only way we have of living. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a point there you touched on that I would like to ask you a little bit further about, because I think it's also a very big point you make in the book. So at a certain point, you mentioned that uh, austerity is presented as a politically neutral theory in economics. But is there really any apolitical theory in economics? Absolutely not. Um, absolutely not. And this is a very important uh, message and theme of the capital order is um, showing how austerity emerges with the emergence of the dominant economic framework that we still study today as economic students, yeah. which is normally called neoclassical framework. Um, and by giving faces and names to the experts who were really the first to diffuse this economic framework, it, I really am able to show how political the project was from the very beginning. So um, uh, so this, I think, is important that the power of the historian is to avoid abstractions, avoid the idea that anything we read in a book is there and has no one, you know, who has worked for delivering that certain theory, but that actually this theory comes out of specific people who had a very specific project. And of course, it was a very political project because the austerity project was all about um, silencing the demands of the workers. Now, you asked me, is there any neutral theory? I would definitely say that the mainstream Mm -hmm. Neoclassical framework still present today is mm -hmm. not neutral and very classist in uh, its explicit attempt to justify uh, capitalism, which is a system that functions through the um, the gain of the few uh, at the cost of the many. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that you know any economic theory is also political because, for example, the theory of Gramsci, who was you know validating the classical political economy tradition from Smith, Ricardo to Marx, um, that was also very political in the sense that it was explicitly saying, well, we are seeing society through the lens of class conflict. And we realize mm -hmm. that it is the worker who is getting structurally screwed by the capitalist system who, because surplus derives from unpaid labor. And so that theory was a theory that was invoking the uh, rebellion of the many uh, uh, against uh, the economic system uh, it was analyzing, right? So it was a theory that was analyzing the system to, in a way, overcome it by looking at the main injustices and contradiction of this economic system. Now, the mainstream theory, which emerges in gets diffused in the years I talk about in the 1920s mm -hmm. um, is a, a theory that does exactly the opposite, is a theory that instead of explicitly showing exploitation, it hides it in the name of supposed market freedom. So the idea that we're all free, which of course is um, complete ideology. And uh, it's a theory, the mainstream theory is a theory that puts the individual um, and especially the entrepreneur uh, in the place of the worker. So again, a framework that by eliminating classes and conflict focuses on individuals and harmony and thus gives a sense that whoever is at the top is because they really deserve it and they are doing the good of everyone else. So this is very important is to realize that any theory, not just economic theory, by the way, any theory can be history, historical theory, political theory, whatever, is deeply embedded in 
the society it's formulated in and it has uh, objectives and just by uh, even implicit objectives, just by the way it, the theory looks at the world, well, then it will have uh, an outcome that uh, is political in one way or another. Uh, so um, another question, at a certain point in the book, you mentioned that uh, we shouldn't really view austerity as a response to economic crisis, but crisis of capitalism. What do you mean by that exactly? So what I think, this is an important question because it gets to the heart of the title of the book. The mm -hmm. book is called The Capital Order mm -hmm. uh, because the intuition here uh, is that capital as well as money invested to make more money, which is the objective of our economic system, mm -hmm. is fundamentally based on a specific way we organize society. It's based on a social relation we take for granted, uh, which is the fact that, again, the majority of us, in order to make a living, has to go and sell one's labor power in return for a wage, and usually a very low wage. Um, mm -hmm. And so the fact that uh, capital as a social relation is the foundation for any economic growth is not something that we, I mean, we do take it for granted, but it is not something that is just out there as a fact, as a natural, as a force of nature, as something obvious and eternal, but it's actually something that has been constructed through time mm -hmm. and it constantly needs protection. So there are historical moments in which capital uh, as this fundamental social relation that runs our society can go into a crisis. And when this happens, this is much more than just an economic downturn. It's more, much more than just in a moment in which economic growth is low uh, or a moment in which inflation is high. Uh, actually, what you see is, for example, that high inflation is much more... is sorry, is intrinsically also a political problem, just not just an economic problem, because it's a moment in which this capital can start shaking because people start questioning whether indeed the type of society we're in is the best one and the only one possible. So this is the main idea that a crisis of capitalism is not just a matter of economic, uh, you know, um, parameters but it's about uh, it's about moments and this happens constantly and it's of course associated with economic with economic problems but it's a much deeper moment of political upheaval in which uh, again we start wondering whether this system is efficient and just as its uh, proponents and supporters suggest so after the first world war um, this is exactly what happened. Actually, another moment of high inflation, like the one we're living at the present, in which people started saying, hey, I don't, we don't think this is the best way to run uh, our world. And that's why capitalism was in deep, deep existential uh, crisis. And this mm -hmm. is a moment in which austerity, in fact, was born because it needed to protect capital as a social relation in order to avoid drastic changes of our society and the thesis in the capital order is that this originating role of austerity in securing capital as an Im immovable and natural force right having us think that in fact we cannot change society this is still the structural role austerity plays today and of course even if we are in, not in the moments of such revolutionary turmoil as after the First World War, um, uh, still today, a lot of people constantly question capital um, in many different ways, also in more spontaneous ways. For example, uh, by deciding to quit their jobs and mm -hmm. uh, participating in the anti-work movement, which is pretty big in the United States right, right now, in which people are so fed up of getting paid so little and getting so high exploitation that they just prefer not to go to work. 
Now, this is less, you know, organized than uh, actual mobilization of workers organization, but it's still a form of um, of uh, of of contrast with the system and of 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 somehow decision to to deeply question it at heart. So even today, I think the fact that austerity has been back with such a vengeance and the increases in interest rates really speak to the fact that economic experts know that in a moment in which there is a shortage of labor supply because people are just not going back to work, the best way to get people to get forced back into accepting their conditions as wage workers is to increase unemployment, to increase our precarious conditions, to take away all they can from the people by privatizing, by cutting social benefits, and in this way, forcing us back, coercing us back into accepting capital. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, also referring to the subtitle of your book, uh, where can we find then the link between austerity and fascism? Thanks. Yes, this is an important, the subtitle of the book is How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. Mm -hmm. um, what the book does is that it contrasts and compares the realities in Great Britain in the 1920s and Italy in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And here we have very different societies, at least uh, at face value, in the sense that we have a liberal parliamentary democracy in Great Britain, the biggest empire, a uh, capitalist empire until that moment. And in Italy, we have a, you know, quite a, a backward country that is experiment, experimenting with the first fascist regime mm -hmm. with Benito Mussolini. And yeah. what you see is that actually both countries were uh, undertaking the same exact austerity measures uh, to defend capital and prevent social change. Mm -hmm. And that experts, mainstream experts, the protagonists of my book, were collaborating in the case of Britain with the Treasury and the Bank of England, um, which were these independent institutions that were by definition keeping the power of economic decisions to themselves, um, keeping away the people who wanted actually to participate in economic decision making. While in Italy, we had experts working with directly with Mussolini's cabinet. And so the whole point, uh, one big message in the capital orders to show that Mussolini's regime, fascism, was strengthened uh, and gained legitimacy both domestically and internationally because it was capable of implementing very effectively austerity measures. Um, Benito Mussolini came to power in 1922 and practiced almost 10 years of harsh austerity by privatizing, by cutting all social benefits by uh, increasing interest rates, by uh, making strikes illegal and repressing wages. The whole package of austerity, fiscal, monetary, industrial was practiced by Mussolini uh, thanks to allying with these economic experts. And this, uh, this guaranteed not only the defeat of revolutionary possibilities in Italy, but also the strengthening of his rule. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one last question then. Do you think that austerity can go away? Uh, and perhaps to be more specific, do you see that, for example, within the field of economics, there has been enough uh, theoretical opposition to austerity and perhaps among the workers there have been any social and political movements that might point to the possibility of us having something like we had in the aftermath of World War I and perhaps do away with austerity or not? Um, thank you. Uh, so I think there's two, uh, p p perhaps two parts to your question. Mm -hmm. One is to look at what's going on within the academia uh, right. amongst uh, technocrats themselves. And I think there's very little hope um, 
as of now in academia in the sense that I believe that a lot of the supposed antagonists of austerity, the supposed critics of austerity, namely all of the variety of Keynesianism, um, is, are actually much more austere than they like to see themselves. So part of the, the story of the capital order is that it helps look critically also at uh, not only Keynes himself, who was very austere in the early 1920s, but also to uh, all the new Keynesian experts who uh, supposedly represent an alternative to austerity policies. So I would say that within the academia, um, we would need a real shift in paradigm, a real going back to a theory that is political uh, in the sense, though, of trying to really um, understand the power games and the structural class conflict that is in the DNA of capitalism as a system. So we would really need to, you know, go back to some classics that have been completely uh, marginalized in current economic courses like uh, Smith, Ricardo and Marx and really figure out what is how capitalism really works uh, yeah. rather than trying to hide how it works and use these models that really only help confuse our ideas about the system and ultimately justify it. So I would say in academia right now, the situation is not rosy because mainstream economic theory, both neoclassical and new Keynesian dominates and there is a very little space for a class analysis like the one I propose in the capital order. Mm -hmm. But I also would say that times are changing to the point that even this book has um, received attention, even on the Financial Times. Uh, yeah. So a, a situation in which clearly there is thirst for different models and different theories that can help us move forward and really um, deal with the serious challenges that capitalism is posing to society, which are ultimately threatening the very possibility of human existence on the planet. So we, uh, you know, it's not it's not just about it's everyone uh, who will suffer unless we try to really move on. Um, and then from the side, let's see, the other aspect of your question is about what's going on in terms of movement politics. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, there is always a lot of movement from below happening. It receives very little attention mm -hmm. Uh the mainstream media is completely um, uh, in the hands of those who don't want to question capital. So you don't want to give space to these alternatives, which are there, though, uh, I believe, all of the time. Um, even uh, right now in the United States, we know that there is a huge amount of uh, strikes and social upheavals going on with uh, proposals for um, actually putting back the worker at the center of the production process. So really with an idea of vindicating economic democracy. And, you know, in Italy, for example, we had had a, a season of movement for the commons that was actually exciting people. Uh, we know that in Chile and in uh, other places in Latin America, we have a lot of council movements that uh, are real. So I think in every space, uh, even if the majority is unfortunately um, subjugated mentally enough to um, be quite passive in its acceptance of the system, there is always an active bunch who could potentially really lead us forward somehow. So I think, but the, the key there is to realize one of the most important intuitions that come from Gramsci that I give voice to in chapter four of the capital order, which is that I don't think theory, and this is not just me, it's Gramsci mm -hmm. and before Gramsci others, is that you can't have action without theory and theory without action. So in a way to really see something that can uh, 
purposefully get us out of the existential disaster we are facing in a society in which really people are completely dehumanized um, is to both have participation, movement, action forward, backed by emancipatory theory. And this theory emerges out of this action itself. So you don't have mm -hmm. a theory that is there and you just pick it and use it. But the theory emerges out of the very experience and practice of, of the people from below. And I think this is really the key that Lordi de Nuovo and my chapter four in the Capital Order really tries to have us think about thoroughly and could help us move forward. Mm -hmm. Great. So the book is again, The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. Uh, Dr. Mate, just before we go, apart from the book, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Um, yes, I have the uh, a new website that uh, a very sweet student of the new school helped me build, um, which is uh, www.claramate.com, without a dot, just dot .claramate.com altogether. Mm -hmm. And uh, there I kind of put, tried to put together all the articles I recently wrote, op-eds, and also... Um, uh, other interviews I gave. So there, you know, you find uh, some. And then I also have Twitter when they don't block me out of it. I don't know why I'm having issues. Not that I'm doing anything. I'm barely tweeting, but I'm already being expelled. But uh, And the Twitter account is uh, uh, Clara E. Mate. So you can follow me there whenever I get the access back because, again, I've been blocked out. <laughs> 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 okay so look uh, thank you so much for come uh, for doing an interview with me and i really love the book so i hope it gets to many people out there thank you so much uh for me the book is uh, really my contribution to changing this world and i really think that in order to change it we first need to really figure out how it works and what are the strategies to preserve it that the really, uh, ruling elite uses. And I would also like to mention that the book is, um, in fact, dedicated to Gianfranco Mattei, who is, uh, to all revolutionaries, and especially Gianfranco Mattei, who is my great uncle, who actually gave his life to defeating fascism um, in Italy. And he died in, uh, in jail. Uh, uh, when uh, the, he was being tortured by the fascists. And in order to not speak and uh, tell on his comrades, he actually committed suicide uh, in support for the cause. And so for me, you know, the fact that there are people still now that are giving their very life to change uh, is very meaningful. And I think that this is something that we all need to remember that before giving up all hope, realizing that uh, collectively, um, things can change, especially that there is a lot of, of eagerness out there. And this is historically the case. And, you know, this touches me personally because um, he was really fighting to defeat fascism and was strong enough to um, give up his own life for change. He wouldn't be very happy seeing what's going on in Italy now, but that's why I think we should all participate for a better future. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to help keep the channel sustainable, please pay a visit to my Patreon page or to PayPal. You have all of the links there in the description box. Even just one dollar would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. Finally, I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perger Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordano Wolf, Tim Hollis, Enrique Alenia, John Collers, 
Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormer, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenk, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslin Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Eira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dan, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichland, and Dr. Bird. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Staffini, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardis France, and Thomas Trumbull. And my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all. <laughs>